It might seem a bit of a strange subject, maybe, to, to look at on a Sunday evening, um, but I guess the, the key issue that sits underneath this subject is how, how reliable is the New Testament? How authoritative is it? Uh, and can we have absolute confidence and faith that the message, the gospel message, which is the power of God unto salvation, can we absolutely believe and have faith in the documents before us that that message is as it was first given that 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 really is the issue it, it's it's so fundamental because it goes to the whole basis of salvation now i have to confess that the the subject itself may be a little dry um, but what I will try and do is to try and make it accessible to you all. So if, if, if you can just bear with me, um, I'm hopeful that, that it will be a, a fruitful evening. So the areas we'll cover is just quickly look at the role of Scripture in salvation. Um, and then consider the general prevailing view on the New Testament um, that's the world's view, and maybe some other religious <coughs> groups' view of the New Testament. Um, and the evidence produced that the prevailing view is correct. Um, and then the approach required to address um, the criticisms that quite often come forward, um, and look at two commonly held misconceptions. And then I'd like to give you what I would describe as an Aunt Sally, so that you can actually get access to, to the methodology used to address it, which is called textual criticism. And then just consider briefly the factors that affect the quality of textual criticism and the position relating to secular texts from antiquity. Um, and then some of the positions relating to manuscripts of the New Testament and some analysis of the variations. Um, so it's, it's quite a long list, um, but believe me, we will get through the list quite, quite quickly. <coughs> so let's just um, start by considering the role of Scripture in salvation. Well, it's, it's very clearly stated there in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, where Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, the good news of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So in other words, this gospel message is a, it's defined, it's a pattern of sound words. It's precisely definable in the word of God. And it's that defined message, we're being told, is the basis of, for gaining salvation. God can use that message, if we believe it, to um, enable um, people like you and I uh, to make a journey from death and from perishing into life and into the kingdom of God, which will be established upon the earth when Christ returns in due time. And... In Romans 10, verse 17, we read, So then, faith, this, this um, critical attribute that is required from those who would seek salvation, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So, this book that we have in front of us now, which is the word of God, the inspired word of God, is critical has a key role to play in enabling us to gain the understanding that we might have faith in that gospel message. So salvation is based on faith in the gospel of Christ Jesus. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Scripture, and that word scripture means the written word. Scripture conveys that message and therefore scripture is vital that it is reliable and accurate. So the general prevailing view <clears throat> concerning the New Testament 
Well, it's generally assumed that the Bible has been translated so many times over the past 2,000 years that it is absolutely impossible to have any confidence in its accuracy or its reliability. In addition, the key question is, can we place any reliance on the New Testament given that the original texts were destroyed almost 2,000 years ago? Now, these are the sort of conversations we're likely to have with people that we meet in our precincts, um, and those people that we meet in the precincts are likely to be driving these arguments home with, with a lot of um, energy and assertion that, in fact, as it is, this, this book is, is, as it were, interesting, um, but not reliable. Well, let's just consider... Um, some of the evidence and the evidence and the um, argument that sits underneath this would be the game of whispers so let me ask the audience who, who here has played the game of whispers anyone yeah okay it's, it's a very amusing game um, what happens is we have say 10 people sitting in a room in a circle one person initiates a message by whispering in the uh, person next to them their ear uh, a, a message, and that message is then whispered all the way around the room, and by the time the message gets back to the originator, it is completely different, or is a derivation of it, and very often uh, the corruption uh, of that original message becomes quite amusing. Uh, and this is claimed to be the basis why we can't rely uh, on the New Testament and the, and the Scriptures generally that those errors are accumulating as it goes past from one generation to, to the next. And, and, and therefore, we, we, we can't place any reliability on, on the book. So, to counter that, we, we need a methodology, a, a systematic approach of addressing um, this issue so that the... Um, arguments that have been presented to us um, can be rejected. It, it needs to be very much focused on the factual approach and it needs to be independent of religious conviction. Uh, in other words, independent and objective. And uh, that methodology has been developed uh, and it's known as textual criticism. So let's just consider some generally held misconceptions. First of all, the transmission of the New Testament is based on the oral tradition and is linear. In other words, it goes from one generation to the next and then to the next generation and it, it is transmitted in that way. Well, neither of those assumptions is correct. Okay? It's really important that we understand that they, that is not correct. It's just not right. The New Testament has been transmitted via scripture and if you look at the word scripture you will find that it means clearly the written word. It's been, the message has been written down right from the very beginning and it was transmitted in a geometric way. In other words the autographed letter for example to an ecclesia would father five copies. Each of the five copies would father another five copies. And hence there was now 25 copies plus the five first copies and the first original. There would therefore be 31 documents in existence, not just five. Uh, this is very, very important to get your mind around the fact that this is the way in which the message and the written word was transmitted from the very beginning um, and, is the, and the outcome of which we have in our hands today. So let's consider the, uh, the Aunt Sally example. So this is just a description independent of the word of God so that we might just actually understand how textual criticism works in practice. So we have this make-believe Aunt Sally. 
some of you might actually have an Aunt Sally. But here we have this Aunt Sally, and she has a dream. She has a dream concerning the elixir of life. She wakes up in the morning and she writes it down. And she makes the drink and takes it every day. And after three days, she no longer needs her Zimmer frame. Uh, her wrinkles disappear. And she rapidly returns to the rudeness of health previously experienced when she was 25 years of age. She then copies the recipe and sends it out to her five closest friends. They use the elixir and they have exactly the same experience. And then suddenly, unexpectedly, Aunt Sally and the five friends lose their recipes. And the call goes out to recover all the remaining manuscripts of which there are 25. These 25 manuscripts are compared word by word. And it's found that 22 manuscripts are absolutely identical. There is therefore a body of evidence to suggest that those 22 manuscripts actually precisely and accurately reflect the original recipe that Aunt Sally wrote down on that first morning when she woke up having had the dream. We find one has a spelling mistake, one has two phrases inverted, in other words, mix then chop, rather than chop and mix. One has an ingredient that none of the others have. So based on this database of manuscripts, can Aunt Sally's reconstructed recipe put, be put together? And the answer is absolutely yes, it can. And that is the basis of what's actually happened with regard to these manuscripts. All the spelling mistakes can be corrected, the inversions can quickly be restored, and the additional ingredient that had been added would be deleted. Now, I wouldn't suggest with any methodology that it's perfect, but hopefully you can see the logic that underpins the arrangements whereby the translators have worked to produce this word that we have in front of us this evening. As I say, this, this science is known as textual criticism. Now, textual criticism is not just used for the scriptures. It, it is used for all documents of antiquity. And um, we, we can um, see how that works through um, in, in various documents that we have before us, not just the New Testament, but other, other documents. But the, the key thing with textual criticism is um, that it is quality and, and its reliability is determined by really two key things. How many copies are there do we have to examine and compare? Uh, and, and how close in time are those existing documents compared to the autographed version. The autographed version is the original. So, for example, when we go through the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, on occasions, says, I've actually autographed this letter, this epistle, as, as you would uh, if you were sending a letter to your close friends today. Uh, ideally, there would be lots and lots of copies and the oldest copies will be very close to the original that has been sent out. You, you can see how that worked in the Aunt Sally example. Now, this slide is very busy. I'm, I'm sorry if, you, if you're struggling to see it. I'll, I'll just talk you through it. it. Here's some examples of some documents that we have from antiquity. So, the Jewish war, wars written by Josephus. He was a Jewish historian who wrote round about AD 70 um, and all the events led up to AD 70 and the destruction of the Jewish commonwealth the oldest earliest manuscript is the 5th century and there were nine manuscripts available everyone generally assumes that actually that historical account is hugely reliable except for one comment maybe that one comment would be, he actually writes in, there was a man called Jesus who was raised from the dead. 
they question whether that was his original words. I don't see any reason why we should question that testimony that Josephus gave. Annals of Imperial Rome, Tacitus, a Roman senator which covers the period AD 16 to 68, written round about AD 68. Middle Ages is the precise date unclear. There's two manuscripts for that. And we could go through this. The second from the bottom, the dialogues written by Plato, circa 350 BC. The oldest version is 650 AD. There are seven manuscripts available for Plato's works. On the bottom of that slide, I've just written, most ancient documents of antiquity have only a handful of manuscripts and have a time gap of between 800 and 1,000 years. No classical scholar would question the accuracy of the transmission of the autographed document. That, that is so important to grasp hold of. Put the New Testament to one side, the world of academia has such confidence in this methodology that they generally accept that the translations that we've got of these works of antiquity are wholly reliable. What about the New Testament? It's generally assumed that the autographed version of each of the 27 books of the New Testament were completed round about AD 70. That there is a lot of discussion around the book of Revelation in terms of whether it was written early or whether it was written late. Personally, I think it was written late, but um, that's largely irrelevant. We're talking about the um, autographed versions for the New Testament being fully completed and prepared during the first century. We have 5,488, 5, as of 1992, um, manuscripts consisting of Greek manuscripts. Um, there are 96 papyri, uh, includes many fragments that go back as early as 160 AD. There's 290 un unseals, in other words, they were written in capital letters. 2,812 minuscules, written in cursive, in other words, joined up writing, and 2,281 lectioners, which are small copies of scripture for circulation among the church for liturgical readings. In other words, priests or men of religious persuasion would carry small sections of scripture which have been written out and go to a congregation in the Outer Hebrides or wherever it was and actually use that reading um, as a basis for uh, their meeting on that particular uh, Sunday. There's a lot of material. There's a huge amount of material as a consequence of all these different sources. So textual critics, the New Testament, are embarrassed by the wealth of the material available. Instead of uh, a lapse of circa a millennium, or more, as with the secular text, the, the oldest papyrus manuscripts of the New Testament in extent are less than a century from the original autograph version. Quite remarkable. So given that there's so many manuscripts, they tend to be grouped into families. The main families are the majority text, known as the Textus Receptus, which is 95% or more of the existing manuscripts and then there are the minority texts there's a family of minority texts which are derived from the Alexandrinus which was, um, goes back to the 5th century uh, which came out of Egypt and uh, is supported by some of the earliest manuscripts uh, interestingly located in the British Library and the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus and the Beza they all uh, understood to, um, to be derived from the, the Alexandrinus. So uh, there are two groups of, of texts. Um, it's well understood um, that the, where they've come from uh, uh, and their authentication. 
There are two further sources of textual criticism. There's the, the ancient translations of the New Testament. Uh, in the 3rd and 4th century, the New Testament was translated into Coptic, Syriac, Latin, Armenian, and Georgian. Uh, and these provide a significant insight into the underlying Greek manuscripts. And there are other ancient extra-biblical sources which include the catechisms, uh, a group of questions and answers about Christian beliefs, lectionaries which we've referred to above, um, and quotes from church fathers that record the scriptures. So we have an immense amount of material which relate to Christian literature. We're not talking about an impoverished situation, quite the reverse. There is a huge amount of material in which to work from. So when we analyse all of that information and we go through it all and we apply textual criticism to it, there are basically two passages of scripture which has some question over. One of those passages we read this evening, it was Mark's Gospel and uh, verse 9 through to verse um, 20. Now, some of you may have a modern version in front of you, um, such as the NIV um, or some other translation. You might find that those words are not actually in on the main page of your, your Bible. It might be or it might be placed within brackets. Um, but it's certainly in the authorised version. Uh, and there are a couple of verses um, in John's Gospel, at the beginning of that Gospel, uh, concerning the woman taken in adultery and chapter 8. Now, outside of that, outside of those two passages, that there are no disputes about what the message is. Uh, and indeed, if you go through those two passages, not one single major doctrine is at stake. In addition, there's nowhere in those two passages of Scripture where there is a unique piece of the message located that would somehow derail the rest of the message in the rest of the book. Quite the opposite. And the question is, why, why do we actually have these these differences well it comes back to the source of the manuscripts used in the translations the majority text known as the Textus Receptus as we said already and the minority texts which are based on the Alexandrian text those are the two main sources the majority text includes 95% of all manuscripts they were brought together by Lucian Erasmus Stephanus and Beza, early Christian fathers, and the authorised version is based on those manuscripts. Now, I'm not arguing that one translation is better than the other, but the other modern translations, such as the NIV and the NASB, which is the American Standard Bible, and the JW Bible, are based on the minority text and draw heavily upon the Codex Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. Now, when I do a study, and I'm sure there's the same for, for many others in this room, I, I use the authorised version, but I also consult other versions because they can bring valuable insight into the, any passage that we're looking at. But in terms of Mark chapter 16 and John chapter 8, I'm absolutely convinced that... That is part of Holy Writ. So let's just codify why that is the case. What we're saying is, we open our scriptures up, and we've got Mark chapter 16 in front of us. I believe verse 9 through to verse 20 is part of scripture. Um, it's why? Well, it's because it's from the majority text. There's uh, the vast majority of those, those manuscripts uh, support that scripture. And in doing and making that conclusion, you actually then have to go back to the methodology used 
in textual criticism and say, well, OK, uh, is it right that if, if there is something additional uh, in some versions that we actually extract it and remove it? Question mark. Maybe that's not correct uh, as a methodology or a robust methodology, given the way in which um, these manuscripts have been um, used. When we <clears throat> look at the, the other gospel records, we find in each gospel account there is what's called a prologue. In other words, there is a, uh, a section within each of the gospel records which actually um, records the Lord Jesus Christ commissioning his disciples to go out and to witness to the things that they had seen and to preach the gospel record. It would be very, very odd, therefore, if Mark's gospel was the only gospel that didn't have this prologue or this record of the commissioning of the apostles and disciples. And indeed, if you read chapter 16, and if it were to finish at verse 8, it would be rather an abrupt ending. So comparing it to other gospel accounts and other scriptures, it, it, it would seem odd. If, if, those, if that passage um, that we have in, in Mark's Gospel, verse 9 to 20, wasn't part of Holy Scripture. And let's just look at that passage. What it says there, and here's probably the critical point, isn't it? It's there in, in verse 15. It says, And Jesus said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptised shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned, or condemned. It's very hard-hitting, isn't it? It's very hard-hitting, but, but Scripture is like that. Scripture can make us feel quite uncomfortable at times in the way it's so uncompromising in the message that it transmits. Well, Okay, so maybe we don't like that and we want to rub that piece out. Well, come with me to John's Gospel. Because in John's Gospel, we have a record of the Lord saying exactly the same thing. John chapter 3, speaking to a Pharisee named Nicodemus, we read... In verse 4, chapter 3, Nicodemus saith unto Jesus, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And then we have a, an ex explanation of what that word spirit means in verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. In other words, you have to be born of water and develop the right attitude of mind, a spiritual attitude of mind, the spirit of Christ, if we are to attain unto salvation because we cannot enter into the kingdom of God unless we um, develop that attribute of habitually thinking in the right way and we have been baptised into the saving name of Christ this exactly accords with the words that we have in Mark chapter 16 so it's interesting that Mark finishes with that and it endorses the message elsewhere what I would argue to you is if you're really determined to take it away from the, the, the book of scripture you can, it doesn't diminish the message that the scripture is setting forth I, I think it should be included so overall conclusions, we have approximately 300,000 variations when we take all of that material across all of the manuscripts but 98.5% of those variations are inconsequential they are things like spelling errors and phrase inversions and the rest yield to textual criticism leaving round about 400 words 
which may raise some question over whether they should be there or not. These refer to Mark 16 and John 8. However, if you take the majority text, then actually those 400 words and the issues relating to those 400 words, they also disappear. So the overall grand conclusion of the matter is that actually there is an approach, it's called textual criticism, there is a huge amount of material which enables that methodology to be applied, the outcome of which is we can have absolute confidence that the message contained in our New Testament is totally reliable. That's good news because it's on that basis that we have salvation. Thank you.